And, you know, cancer, we know, has a very strong connection to diabetes. There's no question about it. Um, we've heard you talk in the past about angiogenesis. Um, can you help our audience understand what angiogenesis is and what foods can limit the angiogenic process and uh, reduce the rate at which tumors progress? Sure. So angiogenesis is essentially the process by which cells receive blood, which they need in order to reproduce and, and flourish. And um, normally the body has a really smart ability to feed the good guys and not feed cancer cells. So most of us have cancer cells in our body right now. Um, but our body is capable of cutting off the blood flow to them. Angiogenesis is the feeding process. Anti-angiogenesis is actually the body's kind of immune system in a sense. It's the body's ability to cut off that blood flow. And a properly working anti-angiogenic system can do just that. Um, but what happens in the case of cancers that proliferate and become dangerous is that they actually kind of mainline their own blood supply and they veto the body's anti-angiogenic capacities. And they do that with the body kind of falling asleep at the switch. It, it, it fails to cut off what it should cut off. So, um, so what we're learning is that there are certain foods that are directly linked to the body's native anti-angiogenic capacities, foods that, that help to um, help the body do its job and regulate blood flow to cells. And those seem to be the exact same foods that epidemiological studies tell us are linked to lower rates of cancer. So fascinating, right? Um, and, and it actually seems that anti-angiogenic foods uh, can help not only with prevention, but potentially even with reversal in some cases with cancer. Now, we've always got to be careful when we talk about reversal with cancer. This isn't medical advice. I'm not telling you what to do. To, I'm not telling you don't do chemotherapy. I'm not saying anything about that. You make your own choice. What I am saying is that it might be helpful and that a lot of times the same things that are good for prevention are also good for reversal. And I think that's pretty hopeful. Um, and so, uh, you know, what foods are we talking about? Generally speaking, we're talking about fruits and vegetables. Um, probably one of the most potent is red grapes. Um, red wine has been touted for its health benefits, but let's be very clear. It's not the alcohol that's helpful. It's the red grapes that are in there. And even red grape juice may be beneficial. I'm generally not a fan of fruit juice, and there's a lot of good reasons for that. But if you can tolerate it and it works for you, red grape juice may be the one that's, that's most beneficial. But red, eating red grapes is always better. Um, and then pomegranates are amazing, um, blueberries, um, and then all the leafy greens. You know, I mean, the usual suspects, how often do we hear, eat your veggies, <laughs> but you know what? It's true. And let me just bottom line that, it, you know, we talk about servings and people are like, oh, I had a leaf of kale, you know, like you, you, you really want to do more than that. Like, you know, like think about a bunch or two or three bunches of kale, you know, daily, you know, or cabbage. Like, it's not just like a leaf of cabbage. Think about like eating a half a cabbage, like start to think of veggies as being the main course. Um, the centerpiece of your meal, because the more you can fill up on vegetables, the healthier you, you will be. And it can be a bit of an acquired taste, and I, I fully recognize that. But you will acquire it. Your taste buds will change and adapt. So, um, so yeah, anti-angiogenic foods, again, it's, it comes back to the same suspects. It's the, it's the vegetables, it's the leafy greens, and uh, it's some of the really potent antioxidant-rich uh, fruits and veggies that, that um, you know, we hear about all the time. <laughs> and... So add them to the list again. And, uh, and, you know, lo and behold, there are no animal products that are particularly anti-angiogenic. So there too, you know, the meat and dairy industry isn't happy about this one, but it's what the data tells us. So let's talk about the cost difference between these healthy foods you were just talking about and, you know, some packaged foods and getting animal products at McDonald's for, you know, very cheap. A lot of people are, they're concerned about that. Like, oh, you know, I can't follow this diet. It's too expensive. So is that true? Can you shed some light on that topic? Well, the first thing I want to say is that uh, I, don't, I don't want to be glib about this. For people who are living paycheck to paycheck, it can be challenging. Not so much to eat healthy food, but to eat healthy food that you like without spending your whole life cooking. I mean, let's be honest that if you don't care about taste too much, and you're really flexible, 
you can eat really simply and really well. You can, it doesn't take a lot of time to cook a pot of beans and cook a cabbage, and it doesn't cost a lot of money. And beans, lentils, even quinoa are pretty, pretty affordable. Uh, more affordable, even calorie for calorie, than McDonald's. Um, but if you want to get into more tasty things, then it can take a little more time to prepare sometimes. And, um, you know, unfortunately, most of our processed foods are convenient and they're tasty and they've hijacked our taste buds and they've hijacked our economy. So we have a subsidy system in the United States where the U.S. taxpayer is actually uh, subsidizing what we call commodities crops, uh, which are essentially our corn, our soy, our wheat, the, the big staple crops. And what this ends up doing is bringing down the price of factory farmed animal products because most of the corn and soy is fed to them. And it's bringing down the price of high fructose corn syrup. And it's bringing down the price of Wonder Bread. And it, it's, you know, if we took that tens of billions of dollars that we are using to subsidize junk food and we put it towards kale and cabbage and broccoli and the stuff we should be eating more of nuts and seeds, we would see... Uh, a totally different economic system, and we would not be essentially penalizing the poor the most for trying to do the right thing. So I am a big advocate for changing the subsidy system. I, I personally don't know that um, taxes should be going to subsidize any form of food. I think free market would be better than what we have now. We don't have a free market. Uh, it's tilted. But if we are going to subsidize anything, let's subsidize the good stuff. Let's make it easier for everyone to do the right thing. And, and relatedly, we have a food stamp program also called SNAP, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, that in the U.S. Uh, is largely used in convenience stores, 7-Elevens and so forth, for a lot of junk food. And there are some piloting programs where they give uh, recipients double value for fruits and vegetables and where they start to accept SNAP at farmer's markets. And what we're seeing in communities that have adopted this, and there are about 500,000 Americans right now that have access to this uh, testing, uh, they eat a lot more fruits and vegetables and their health outcomes improve. So you know, if we are a society that cares about future generations, if we're a society that cares about the poor having opportunity, if we don't want to foot the bill for higher medical costs because of emergency medicine, because people are so sick, then we ought to invest in preventing this problem in the first place by making it easier for people to do the right thing. So I think there are some basic structural changes we could make that would radically improve the health outcomes for literally millions of people and help to save our economy long term. And that's where I want to see us go. But as an individual, let's suppose you want to eat healthy and you can't change the entire government tax system and you don't, uh, don't have the ability to reverse all this. What can you do? Okay. So number one is get comfortable within your budget with the healthy foods you can afford that are really good for you. And again, legumes, lentils, you know, beans, all that is great. Cabbage, carrots, onions, you know, uh, those are great. Growing food can be great. Um, getting connected to a CSA community for agriculture program can be a good way to invest in a local farmer and you get a share of their harvest and often you get have to be a little flexible because if they had a good harvest this week on tomatoes you're gonna get a whole lot of them you know but but in general uh, CSAs can be a nice way to get cheaper food um, and then uh, and then you know share the cooking process with other people if you're like most of us and you're a little busy and you don't have a ton of time then uh, cooking for yourself takes a lot longer than cooking for three or four people. So pool resources. If you live in a big family, that's easier, uh, especially if they eat like you do. But let's suppose they don't, or let's suppose you live alone. Then uh, you find other people who do share your food values. Maybe they're at work. Maybe they're in a church group or a, a local community or a choir. Find some other folks. Raise your hand. Hey, I want to eat healthy food, and I want to pool the, the, the effort. Who wants to join me, right? You can create a, a healthy meal swap team. You can or a co-op or a, a meal share kind of thing. I'll make dinner on Monday, you make it on Tuesday, we'll share lunch on Tuesday, whatever it is, you start to get an economy of scale going. And you know what? It's good for your social life and you'll have more love and connection in your life as well. So I think that uh, the challenge of loneliness and isolation that a lot of us feel in the world right now, uh, that healthy food can actually be a doorway to bridge that gap through building positive social connections and relationships. 
Um, so those are some of my top tips. And the other thing I want to say is if you are making a radical change in your diet, uh, it's going to take some time to build new habits, but it gets easier and easier. It, when, when it rains, the water flows into gullies and it has its grooves that it likes to go down. And you can change those grooves. Get out there with a shovel and make a new gully and then the water will all go there in the future. And over time, carve out something like the Grand Canyon. Over time, the grooves get deeper and deeper and deeper. And so my suggestion to you is that if, if you're thinking about changing your diet and you think it's difficult, just remember, it is some work to get out there with that shovel the first time to develop the habits and the pathways. But the longer you stay with it, the easier it gets.